Welcome to the, tonight's event, tonight's, tonight's New York section meeting, Media Asset Management. As you can tell, we're here. And thank, thank you to BMCC for hosting us. Section announcements, we're gonna make this kind of quick. First, I'm gonna talk about elections. Elections. How many people in the room are SMPTE members? All right, so you got probably in the mail the ballot. Elections began for section managers um, and officers on Monday, and we'll go for, I don't know how long, about a month. April 27th, about a month. So please vote often and early. You get a choice of three managers out of the five candidates. The, the information is on the ballot, so ple uh, please just go to the website. You'll see the descriptions of everyone you want. Bill Miller wants to say something. Yes, a reminder, if you are an associate member, you are entitled to vote in section elections. Associate members are entitled to vote. I don't believe student members are. So once you get to the level of being a student and you graduate, you can become an associate member and then you can vote. Okay. Enough said. Uh, on that point, we recently had elected or have elected a new um, president of the societies here tonight. I want to introduce Bob Seidel. Hello, Bob. <laughs> volunteers. First of all, I want to thank the volunteers who are helping tonight. Uh, both with the AV and the intake of guests. Um, and recognize that these are, uh, me many of these are members of the BMCC student chapter. Uh, John Gallagher is uh, the wrangler of the BMCC chapter and we're hoping to get that off the ground. Thank you, volunteers. What do we do to grow this section? We need participation. Um, and uh, of course we produce these events. Uh, also, we are reaching out uh, to youth and to women. I'm trying to get a bit of a women's caucus. If you're a woman and you want to have a voice in the section, contact me. We actually have one person who's a woman who's on the ballot. I can't talk about that person in particular, but just, note, just make a note of it. We want to have more participation, more women's voices, more youth, and uh, take the gray hair here. Did I? The gray hair and turn it into blonde and darker colors of younger people because the youth are our future. Is anyone here from uh, uh, City Tech? Did you want to say something? You, I, I got a request. All right, so one of the things we did to grow this section is I, I actually, with a few other members from ABC, led a, led a tour of City Tech, which is our second student um, organization, and they just wanted to say something. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Farisa Ahmed. I am a, a member of the student chapter at City Tech in Brooklyn. We had a fantastic uh, tour by uh, that was led by Bruce Fulmer, Nick, Tim, and Mike. Right. We got to learn uh, a lot of the history and culture of ABC. They spent a lot of time with us. We thank them very much for that, and this was all possible because of SMPTE. I hope that we get more opportunities like this in the future. We discussed job opportunities, and um, we also did post-production workflow at ABC, which was great. We got to see some of the studios, which is a great experience also. The students were mesmerized, dumbfounded, and they loved it. So thank you very, very much for this. So if you have a facility, or can be a speaker, an advisor, or accept visitors at your facility, as we did at ABC, please help us. Let's grow the section. Upcoming events, really quick. We actually have two April events. This is kind of a record breaker, although we had two November events. April 22nd at B&H Photo Video, Mark Foreman will produce event. Mark, what is it about? It's all about filters, electronic filters and a filters that are optical. Um, both Tiffins are going to present. Uh, 
Ira Tiffin from Schneider Optics is going to present, and we're going to have two presenters from Tiffin Incorporated. They're two separate companies, but the, but the same family. Thank you, Mark. Okay, also, AES has reached out to join us and co-produce, we're actually co-producing an uh, event on April 28th, that's the, the week after. So these are coming right on the heels of NAB. This, the topic for the AES meeting is microphones, all you want to know about microphones. And there are four vendors will be coming. Uh, I don't have them off the top of my head, but you'll certainly get the notice for both of these meetings in, in April. And um, the normal Eventbrite invitation. So moving from local announcements to tonight. Yes? What, uh, what's that? Technology Summit on Cinema is part of NAB. Produced by Simpty. Okay, so this is always, uh, well, at least traditionally in the last several years, we do a big event at the, in conjunction with the, with the uh, NAB show. Uh, by the way, there's one other event, uh, which is this month. Tomorrow, there's a webinar on uh, UHD TV, SDI. So you probably got a blip on, about that. It's just a reminder, if you're interested in the webinar, uh, check it out, it's tomorrow. All right, so tonight's producers, Warren Singer and Sa Sarah Cudlery. Sarah, help me. <laughs> Sarah or Warren? I'm on my own. Cudlery. Did I say that right? Cudlery, Cudlery, Cudlery. Now everybody in the room remembers how to say that. Warren? Here's your presenters for tonight. Thank you. The first speaker tonight, we're going to do it alphabetically. So it is, if we look at that, it should say Dalit. And Luke is in the, has he come? You're up. And his, oh, he didn't, you were supposed to put the, the papers up. His title is Metadata as an en Enabler. Thank you. Thanks. Um, where's, the slides? where's the presentation? OK. If, if I'm back like this, can you actually hear me back there? Or do we need, no, so we have to go close on like this. Is there somebody with AV? Can we actually increase the volume of this? One, two, three. Can, does the podium go, no, the po podium is fixed. That's what I was saying. They're all over here. Is there an audio engineer? John Gallagher, are you on the floor? I believe these are your presentations. Uh, no. No? Try looking in here. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Uh, do you want to give me one, two, three? One, two, three. Can everybody hear me? Hello, one, two, three. Yes. That better? Ooh. Hello, one, two, three. Good. All right, so uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you, Simti, for uh, inviting uh, us uh, to speak about uh, media asset management. Uh, my name is Luke Camo. I'm the uh, Senior Business Development Manager for Della Digital Media Systems. We've been the uh, enterprise media asset management and production platform uh, in the industry for over 25 years. Um, our product spans across uh, various verticals from news production to sports, um, uh, legal auditing, as well as uh, um, program preparation and uh, studio post work. 
So I want, this is the end of my pitch about uh, the LED. And I wanted to talk about metadata as being the enabler of your organization in the context of a, uh, of a media asset management solution. Um, so as everybody knows, uh, more and more new challenges for organizations um, to cater to the new demands and the new rea realities of the market. So uh, habits change, uh, interfaces change to actually reach out to your, uh, to your audience, uh, and techn obviously technologies change. Um, one of the key aspects of, of all this is as you start creating and collaborating, how do you make your content relevant, and how do you make the children of your content relevant and related. So a very simple example, if I record you know, a shoot and I produce a, a promo out of it, I want to inherit all the information from the original piece into the children that I produce so that I don't have to recaption it, I don't have to re-review the rights information, et cetera, et cetera. So metadata is going to play a huge part in being able to broker and trigger a media assets management's capability to orchestrate process and, de and derive processes based on this metadata. So there's really two, two areas of metadata that, uh, that I wanted to touch on. One being rich metadata. So very simple example, if I wanted to quantify I'm a big fan of 24, so if I wanted to quantify Kiefer Sutherland is in this scene right now. If I wanted to be able to track um, his height, his birthday, uh, any kind of related data, I would need to enter that every time I enter this record uh, in order to be able to search, i.e. the user must, would need to enter numerous time, height, weight, if you want to search upon this. The notion of creating unique entities as record, like a person is a unique entity, and associating a lot of rich information to that unique entity, his height, et cetera, et cetera, greatly minimizes the amount of data entry to have rich metadata set. I just need to say it's Kiefer at this point, and all the rest will flow without operators uh, entering this information. It also means that you can relate that metadata to various purposes, equivalencies, for example. Kiefer Sutherland is Jack Bauer. Jack Bauer is Kiefer Sutherland. Search either or, you're still getting the result of that unique entity. The same thing I would have uh, movies or episodes in different languages, which all mean the same. And, and those equivalencies compared to the traditional approach of I will create a Spanish field, I will create an Italian field, and, then, and thus having to enter manually in those different sections uh, this metadata. And using this metadata is how we can then derive orchestration in the media asset management context. This is where we'll be able to uh, garner this metadata and, and sequence together not only processes, plenty of solutions do process sequencing, first acquire, then transcode, then analyze, et cetera, et cetera, but also incorporate human interactions with that. Sequence human tasks that you can monitor and analyze the effectiveness of that particular task and getting visibility into the entire workflow from beginning to end, including human manual actions uh, within the system. Did you know that you, there's 148 ways of ordering a Big Mac? Um, so, so this basically takes us into the the notion of multi-deliverables stemming from, uh, from uh, one single thing that you're, you know, like a movie, an episode, uh, a news uh, story. So having the man not only catalog atomic elements, videos, images, PDFs, and having metadata sets around that, 
you also want to have a data model that's flexible enough to represent something that is related and bundled together. Think of a, think of a meal. I'm going to have ingredients, which are all my elements, my video, my images, et cetera, et cetera, all my sources. Then I'm going to have recipes. I need to make an international version. I need to send uh, a Netflix version. And the recipe is going to say, well, for the international, we're going to use the uh, Spanish dub, and we're going to have the French closed captions. And from that recipe, we create meals, the deliverable itself that orchestrates the forwarding of that content. So having a, an asset management that will orchestrate that process and automate that process without having to physically assemble the, the atomic components for each deliverable uh, on the way out. And playing nice obviously uh, ties into the fact that um, any, any media asset management project needs to play nice with a lot of existing infrastructure in your organization. So building a, a framework of, of connectivity within those systems have always been, um, you know, like a v from a vendor to a vendor's integration. Um, there's a lot of, uh, of movement uh, moving forward to have a, a, a standard way of interfacing multiple systems together uh, outside of the traditional uh, API from vendor X to vendor Y. And once you have from vendor X to vendor Y integration and one of them changes their version or their build, you're breaking that link where vendor Y will then need to, to, uh, to change uh, their code. And even within the same vendor, having some different standards that make it not connecting uh, properly. So one of the big initiatives that, that Dalet is participating, uh, participating on as well is this notion of, uh, of building universal uh, connectors. So your transcoder adhering to, for example, FIMS, uh, FIMS standard means that you could plug in, in, in this example, a transcoder, and tomorrow, should you wish to change that one, no code needs to be written. You can, without interruption of your system, just bring in another solution, and it's the same communication uh, layer between those new uh, interfaces. So making it an enterprise service bus approach where you could easily replace components without having to re-engineer uh, your workflow within, uh, within your architecture. That's the uh, quick and dirty uh, overview. Thank you. As Warren comes back, let me remind you all to turn off your cell phones. If I, re if I remember the alphabet correctly, we will next have a speaker from Empress. The speaker is David Miller, who is COO. Hi, good evening, Dave Miller. Uh, I'm the CEO here at uh, Empress Media Asset Management, uh, EMAM, and uh, we're a New York company. We love it here in New York. It's a great place to be and uh, do business. Um, tell you a little bit about our system and then uh, kind of a general issue that's going around uh, just about everywhere these days. So um, our, our goal, our mission is to put everything together, so put on um, different systems, different locations, different processes, different people all together. So, great. It looks kind of good at high up in the air. I want to see how that will look on our NAB booth. And uh, in terms of putting systems together, we, uh, our mission is to build integrated workflows. So, um, uh, transcoding, ingest, 
uh, file acceleration, uh, storage, etc. So putting all kinds of different systems together uh, to build a complete uh, workflow solution or the complete system. Uh, we're on a Windows Server platform, so scalability is very easy, and uh, we have a lot of options for storage. Um, uh, in terms of storage, a big uh, component of that is always LTO uh, for customers, both from a protecting your media for long terms and for a um, for the price point, which is very important on premise. So we integrate with almost all the leading uh, API at an API level with all the leading middleware systems. Our basic MAM technology of, of using the system from wherever you are, uh, integrating with uh, in-process workflows, so uh, working with the editing system. Uh, Adobe is very much open, so we're, we like to work very, very closely with them worldwide, uh, as well as the other systems. Uh, working with cloud systems, uh, uh, whether it's delivery points or working from cloud storage or cloud, um, cloud processing. And then in the future, we'll be moving more and more to uh, providing complete integrated broadcast systems. So that's kind of our long-term goal of putting together a complete system uh, integrated at the API level. Uh, in terms of making it real easy for people to use, whether it's our really thin, uh, on the lower corner, uh, client interface that uh, people can easily share and uh, consume the media, as simple as shopping. And then our more powerful widget-based interface in the upper left-hand corner, which is HTML5 usable in any device. So uh, try to make it really easy, really simple for people to use the media and uh, minimizes training and maximizes acceptance. And the same from native, uh, native apps. So in the uh, Android and iOS, consume the media, use the media, wherever it is in whatever system, it's, and so on and so forth. So one of the big things that I hear every year at NAB whenever I go from the smoke field rooms is one word, the cloud. There's a great future in the cloud. That's what people tell me. The cloud's scalable, it's flexible, it uh, can be rapidly deployed, uh, universally access accessible, uh, whether it's people consuming the media or people uh, or pushing the media out from the cloud. OpEx model as opposed to CapEx model, obsolescence, IT staffing is minimized. So th there's a lot, of, a lot of interest everywhere in the cloud. But there's still some problems. Uh, security concerns is one of the tandem on issues. So the content's not behind our firewall, not according to our permissions. And I'm concerned about people uh, accessing that. Uh, the last mile, how do I get my content up to the cloud? Or it's going to take too long to get there. And uh, also important for editing in terms of I need really rapid access to that high-res media. So that's going to be an issue. Uh, the high cost of things in the cloud. And then if I lose my connection, I've lost my content. So here's the, here, there's a lot of challenges with the cloud. And the reality is can, can be a little bit different than the hype. Security, so the CIA is making a whole new cyber security division. So security is on everybody's uh, fingertips. And if your real value is your uh, digital assets, so protecting them is your key mission. So some organizations will never use cloud infrastructure. How do I get this stuff up there? So if I'm, look, if I'm talking about you going from SD to HD to 4K, you're talking about very big files. And so it can be, you can see in the lower corner, it's going to take a long, long, long time to get that thing up to the, up to the cloud. Now, you can use file acceleration. If I use a 45 meg pipe, it's going to get there much, much faster, but it's still going to take a long time to get there if it's some high-res content. So this is a challenge. This is a problem. Storage, uh, you can look and see what cloud storage versus on-premise storage. You're going to pay a lot of money for storage. And then also transcoding. So. Um, some of the partner transcoding systems, and this is on AWS. And no, yes, there are cheaper alternatives. There are other alternatives. But regardless, it's going to be a lot of money for dedicated transcoding up in the cloud, depending on the system you're using. And then access. Um, not much to talk about here. You lose, your, you lose the plug, you lose your content. So how do you address these issues, and how do you make a real strategy? Um, security. Well, that's a big, important one. So I have a whole list of acronyms here. But the funny thing is, from a medium-sized company perspective, they can't do any better 
in-house than what Amazon's going to give you out of the box. There's all these certifications, everything else with Amazon. So it is a real option for some people, HIPAA compliant, CSA compliant, and MIPA compliant, et cetera. Um, and then it, some, of the, some of the breaches you're going to hear about are not cloud breaches, they're internal breaches. But the question is, can some of the security issues be met, be met with permissions password settings? Can they be met with watermarking encryption? Um, or maybe you just put some of the content, not such urgent content, it's so important, or maybe just lower as proxies and you keep the high res in-house. In, in terms of the last mile concern, if you move to moving just the proxies up in the cloud, my hours and hours on the right-hand side, if I take an H.264 MB4 and throw it up in the cloud, it's not going to take that long for one hour of content. And for a lot of things people need to, to really, really do on a daily basis, that might be an option. Storage, uh, I'm going to slide over this very quickly, but on-premise storage is much, much cheaper than um, uh, generally than cloud storage, and you can move to a model where you're going to do much of the, your storage in-house and then do some of it up in the cloud as needed. Likewise, proxies. So if you have an on-premise proxy system, you can, in some cases, you can buy it for the cost of what it's going to cost you per month in perpetuity. Access. Um, so if you have some kind of a hybrid system where you have some things in-house and some things up in the cloud, then you can, accept, uh, you can address that concern, which is to say you're always going to have access to some amount of the content. So that's kind of our approach is, is to help people build hybrid workflows. You get, the, you get the universality, the low cost, but then you're going to manage uh, the native resolution on-premise, localized storage, localized archive. And that's how we, what we do when we build our system, and that's uh, what we're very excited about. You can do a lot of things. You can do review and approval in the cloud. You can do sharing, everything else in the cloud. But then you can, you can store the native resolution on premise. Um, so what we've moved towards is a distributed architecture where pieces of our system can go here and pieces can go there. And so that gives you the flexibility to really do both. From a service-oriented architecture, we have the pieces of our system are broken off as service components. And you can, you can see them listed here, so that, that builds both scaling and the ability to put them in different places as needed. So then we can, we can, build, we can deploy a system that's in multiple different locations, and at the top is going to be our, our web interface or tablet interface accessing content in the cloud in the middle of the screen. And at different locations, it's sort of a mix and match of what's on premise and then with proxies in the cloud. You can see there's very few red arrows going between, which is to say a lot of the, the high resolution content can be stored locally. Another way of looking at the same thing is on the right hand side, if you, if you go to our web interface, and up in the cloud, perhaps, you have a database and you have proxies up in the cloud, you can manage local resolution, native resolution content, uh, whether it's on the LTO or the SAN, and you can trigger events because of the distributed architecture locally from the web interface. And to take it one step further, you can link together multiple different locations with storage, all, access, all accessible from the cloud interface. So, thank you for your time. We're only a half hour away from schedule so far. <laughs> Very unusual with this group. Our next speaker is from Grass Valley. Ed Kasasha, and he is Senior Segment Manager. Get the screen to come alive here.
Good evening. I, I'm a little taller. I hope you can hear me. Um, it's always with a bit of trepidation that the um, recovering news producer talks to an engineering society. Um, I don't know if Grass Valley needs an introduction. We've been at this for, uh, I counted, 56 years now, and it feels like I've done them all. Um, I wanted to talk about something that is sort of an extension, and it's actually closely related to something our last speaker talked about um, in a unexpected kind of way, is bringing the newsroom to the field, which really implies bringing the asset management with you wherever you go. Um, as uh, our friends from Dillette pointed out, there's a lot of trends right now that are changing the way news is both gathered and then distributed. There's all these news sources, and it's alphabet soup. MMJs, VJs, video journalists, mojos, a favorite that we picked up from one of our customers a few weeks ago, which is Predators, it's producer editors. I like that one a lot. And citizen journalists of increasing importance. All you have to do is look at the uh, um, that startling video of that plane crash in Taipei to realize that there's a lens everywhere. And when there's a lens everywhere, those lenses are what are going to get the best images for you. And then on the, the output side of that is the flip side of that. There's all these new destinations. But there are kind of a couple of challenges for broadcasters out of this. One is these new sources of content. And the other is very interesting. It's a new kind of news worker. And this isn't necessary. This is the kind of challenge. It's an opportunity. Um, and we see some of these new kinds of workers here. While doing this, while dealing with these challenges, concentrating on storytelling. Whoops, one button push, too many. And now we go back. I think we go back. Field personnel today are video journalists. They come out of school prepared and wanting to do a lot of the work themselves that has previously been done by a series of people. Also, editing in the field saves priceless time. This isn't just a question of sending people to remote locations. It's an important in metropolitan areas like this one where drive time will kill you. Um, but. In the context of all of this going on in these field operations, there's still the need to tell the whole story. To tell the whole story, you need to be able to find and access content beyond that that you happen to have with you in a camcorder uh, that you just, that, uh, pictures that you just took. And in fact, what, what it boils down to is for the most part, the degree to which somebody can do the entire job is dictated not by what they know, not what by what they're capable of doing, but by where they are especially in news. The tools traditionally are all in the newsroom. The news is not. As a matter of fact, the news director is having an extremely bad day if there's news inside the newsroom. You also never know, actually it was a colleague of Isaac Hursley's who first said that to me. Um, you never know where the news will be next. And wherever you are, you know you're going to be in a hurry. So the challenge in the field is the access to those tools. In the station, there's ingest control, there's playout control, most importantly, there's content management. And effectively, there's a brick wall in between them. All of that resource is opaque to the, to the news uh, personnel working in the field. The goal is to make it transparent. Oddly enough, the service-oriented architecture, the same service-oriented architecture that really both the previous speakers spoke about, can help alleviate this enormously. So if you look at the definition of a service-oriented architecture, it isn't immediately apparent why this helps. The idea is to decouple. It's a philosophy, not a technology. The idea is to decouple function from code so that they are loosely coupled to each other. And this is a very classic drawing where you have people, process, platform, et cetera, all loosely coupled to the service-oriented architecture. You, it's interesting that you can use this same map to show interactions between system modules that are loosely coupled, making changes. One, it's possible to make changes. It's easy to make changes in an SOA. As I said, slide in a new service. A, a newly developed service replaces an older one. It also is easier and it's more seamless. And this is kind of important. The contact, the con connection, sorry, to the SOA is seamless even over distance. This has primarily been applied to back office system features like asset management. But every organizational function can be expressed as a set of tools. So in addition to content management, the ability to ingest content and control it can be, can be expressed as a set of tools, editing, playout, et cetera. The interactions in current 
service-oriented architectures tend to standardize on the use of two different flavors of web services, SOAP and RESTful over HTTP. For those who don't know, and I imagine everyone in this room does know, SOAP, Simple Object Access Protocol, it is XML-based. It's transport agnostic, works over re remote procedure calls over HTTP, and it requires multiple parsing. In other words, there's a SOAP message that you, op that you identify as a SOAP message. You open it up, you read the header, the header tells you what kind of message it is, and then you parse further and read the body of the message. You can put a lot of information in there, fewer calls. The alternative is REST, which I have a hard time saying, representational state transfer. It is also XML-based. It is more inherently, typically, HTTP. In fact, the key difference in REST is the URL itself carries the entire message. You, re you identify a resource in a URL. That could be a server somewhere. That's the typical thing you identify in a URL. But the rest of the URL functions like a command line argument on a DOS line. It's in addition to running this uh, accessing the service, tell it to do this. Have it, have it hook these things to it. Like, service, like uh, an SOA, RESTful is a style. It's not a technology. It's simply a way of communicating. Now we at Grass Valley are using a RESTful API for our GV Stratus service-oriented architecture. We chose that uh, because it's so sim simple and lightweight. There are pros and cons. Yes, it is chattier than SOAP because the messages tend to be smaller. It's also easier to, uh, to, to troubleshoot than SOAP, however, because the entire message is right there in front of you uh, in text. Um, we use it for search, enumeration, transfer, device control, messaging, etc. Now, even though FIMS is based on SOAP, there's no basic incompatibility between these two because you can, uh, you can apply either API that you wish at the time and you can write connectors between them. So we can talk to FIMS services by simply talking to, making a connector between our RESTful API and a FIMS service and the FIMS SOA bus, uh, so, excuse me, SOAP uh, interface and vice versa. And this is an important goal uh, statement to us. This creation of adapters connectors is an IT standard and accepted practice. And it's not really an obstacle. It, uh, we think of it as an enabler because it really does mean that sort of there, you have an, the ultimate inflexibility. You can use anything you want, and these are not difficult things for the same organization that could implement um, different services by itself anyway using an API. There's, there's really, that same organization has the skills to do this. Now, when, the way we implement this is a typical OSI stack. At the bottom is the physical infrastructure. If I hit them, there we go. The Stratus Core services are network services running across that infrastructure. And at the user, there is this open framework that we, this is literally a blank space. It is a set of hooks. And it is connected and communicates through the, to, through the, the um, service layer entirely through the RESTful API. This API is available. Uh, it's, no, we don't charge for it. It's, we intend it to be used as an integration platform. Um, then the rest of Stratus consists of a very a small bunch of a bunch of very small controls. Uh, some of these, the older ones, are WPF. Uh, the more recent ones are actually done as HTML5. But the key thing is the RESTful API doesn't merely abstract the services from the tools. It doesn't care how far away the user experience is from the services. It can literally be used to abstract distance and make you make the whole idea of how far away you are from the services into a don't care. And in fact, is being used to do that on a daily basis. In this world, users aren't limited by location. It's your logon credentials, not the technology, that limits what you can do remotely. If you want to let someone remotely manage ingest control, it is no different from a software standpoint from them being in the same building or if you're letting them do it from home over the weekend for breaking news coverage. So full control from anywhere. And in a multi-site system, users simply log on to the home system designated as home for, by, for administrative purposes, but have access to everything everywhere. However, editing remains the central task of any television news operation. Going back to that picture, editing is what turns news footage into news stories. 
It is how you take spectacular video, even if it's tragic, and put context and meaning to it. There's an additional challenge for that field worker now, because now they have this, in, in addition to the tools, they have actual content resources back at the station that they might need. They have with them whatever they shot, they have what with, with them whatever someone may have presented to them in terms of user-generated content in, encountered in the field. But back at the station, there's the archive content, there's any feed content, uh, very typically, particularly in an area like this, where the B-roll may be geographically two hours away from the interview, and you send two crews. But it's the guy who did the interview who's writing and editing the story, and, and he's in Jersey City, and the B-roll happens to be at LaGuardia. So a different crew did that. How did, so you need that person in Jersey City who did the interview has to have the ability to see what happened in LaGuardia. And then maybe content from sister stations. And again, you run into this bandwidth wall. There are lots of bad options for dealing with these. The first one is what are known lovingly as black holes. The field editor, excuse me, did it again. The field editor sends back a partially completed story, but it's got gaps in it. Those are the black holes. Somebody back in the newsroom has to fill in the gaps. It's inefficient, it's error prone, and it's a great way to miss deadlines. The next one is backhaul. You feed the station content to the field. That's just plain backwards. You're taking the biggest, most awkward thing you have, which is your full resolution content, and you're sending it through the thinnest pipe you can find to get it back out to, the, back out to the field. It's disproportionate, it's painfully slow. You have to backhaul more than you're ever going to use. And the third one is thumbnet. You guess what you're going to need before you leave the station. You put it on some type of detachable media and you go for it. Well, guessing is a poor strategy. And what if you never go to the newsroom in the first place? And also, what if the content you need did not exist? at the time you left the newsroom. So we think the right answer should eliminate all of these downsides. We created this concept that we call wide area news. Yeah, wham, got it, wide area news. It was my joke and it's not a very good one. Um, but the concept is that field access to resources should be absolutely equal to newsroom access to resources. That's both the tools and the content. Bandwidth use must, use must be optimized but the bandwidth optimization cannot compromise your access. Also, field editors must be self-sufficient. Backhaul of the full res to the, solution, uh, to the field has to be a may, not a must. There are circumstances where you still might want to do it because you might, for instance, want to have somebody completely edit something and roll it in from the field. However, most of the time, you're going to f you, want, you don't want to do that backhaul. And you never want to feed a piece with black holes. So how does that work? Well, our enablers are one persistent proxy. We make it as soon as we've got a frame of video. As a matter of fact, we make it in the same machine as the full res, and we keep it forever. So the proxy is very lightweight in all respects. It's bandwidth, doesn't take up much disk space, it's bandwidth friendly, it's not expensive to make. Then we built HTTP streaming into every system. It's, there's a web server in there that does HTTP streaming, and it's not a, it comes in the serial box. It's just part of how the system works. As a matter of fact, in a Stratus system, you're always using that web, web server to stream proxy, even if you're sitting in the same room with that server. However, we enable local caching on the editor. And then we have to have the NLE work in concert with a very smart conform engine. Okay. Got it? So all the, so the frames are cached locally. Mm -hmm. And actually you can see the lower half of the scrubber bar shows how much is cached. Not too terribly unfamiliar. You see it every day in Netflix and Amazon Prime and YouTube, et cetera. The only difference is that when you move the scrubber, we cache in both directions. Because unlike Netflix, Amazon Prime, et cetera, it, you scrub, you don't just play. Then we take advantage of the fact that the editor is very codec 
agile. It does not care and requires no pre-trans code to put different types of content on the same timeline and it'll play them back to back including do effects between them. Underscoring that, you can have it playing a proxy clip that is H.264 at 2 megabits per second and then the very next thing, a matter of fact, have that be in a 3D effect over a full res clip of AVC Hunter 100. It doesn't care, it'll do it without pre-rendering or anything. <clears throat> Allows the operator to mix local full res with proxy content that's back in the newsroom. All of the editing capabilities are, are, are preserved. 3D effects, transitions, titling, artistic effects, audio track recording, and so on. Then the fun part comes when the editor is done editing. So you have this timeline that looks maybe something like this. You have a full resolution clip that came out of a camcorder, and then the next thing is that B-roll that the, that the crew at LaGuardia got for you. And it's in the newsroom, and you're, and you're using proxy of it to make your timeline decisions. And then you've got this full resolution cli clip that's in 1080p that some guy shot on his GoPro dash cam. And then you've got, finally, the last clip is, again, back to some P2 that you shot yourself. The editor in the field renders every bit of that that it can. So it takes all of those parts there and it renders every bit that it can, affects everything else, and then it says, all right, I got proxy in here, what do I do? What I do is I wrap my piece up in an EDL and I send it back to base where a conform server patches in, patches in the full res. This is, in fact, the black hole workflow. It's simply automated. And it also means that unlike a black hole, the person editing in the field gets to see the edit decisions that they're making. And actually, I think questions happen later. So um, that's it for me. Thank you. Excuse me. Next speaker is from Prime Focus, Patrick McDonald King. Title is An Enterprise Class Cloud Media ERP Solution Developed from an Internal Solution. I think we're still plugged in. If anybody came tonight, because they're really interested in, in the topic, I apologize because this is not what I did a PowerPoint on. I'm doing it on something else. So, uh, where, where are these things? Yeah, I just want to find out where my. I already had it open, but I think it's probably easier. I think I pressed stuff. the wrong button. So, uh, just since we're actually ahead of the game, is that one of yours? Nope. That was actually probably up actually where the folder was, I believe. I saw it. Is this yours? Yes, it is. That's uh, it? Good. Okay. I'm good to go. Super. Hi, everybody. I'm Patrick McDonald King. My company is Prime Focus Technologies. Uh, thanks for having us. We're a supporter of uh, SIMT as well as HPA out in Los Angeles, and happy to be here. Um, our company is a publicly held company with two subsidiaries. One is Prime Focus World, where we do visual effects, 3D, and animation. The other side of the business is Prime Focus Technologies, which is the area that I work in. And uh, we come from post-production and providing content supply chain and automation and media asset management solutions to the entertainment industry. From a creative services side, uh, we've worked on lots of big titles, Avatar, we've done 3D on Gravity. Most recently, we also acquired a company called Double Negative in the UK, which just won an Oscar for Best Visual Effects for Interstellar. On the technology side of the business, Really what we try to do at Prime Focus Technologies is combine media content management and IT skills all under the same roof. Uh, we provide technology and technology-enabled services specifically for broadcasters, motion picture studios, production houses, content aggregators, and digital organizations worldwide. Our goal really is to virtualize the content supply chain. 
Our story began about seven years ago. We transformed several broadcasters in the Asian regions uh, from a tape-based workflow to a file-based workflow. Companies like Star, Disney, Fox, and others took a big bang approach where they moved completely their organizations and digitized it end to end. Uh, migrating the management of their content supply chains and cloud using our MAM, BPO solutions, and orchestration layer software that manages all aspects of broadcast operations, including on-air promos, integration with QC and BMS systems, as well as outsourcing all the media services side of the business, including closed captioning, dubbing, and international servicing to us. Our primary products are Clear and DAX. Uh, Clear is our primary platform. It's an award-winning media ERP solution. Uh, it brings content to the center of the business universe and helps drive creative enablement, lowers total cost of ownership, as well as realizes new monetization opportunities. Uh, media ERP, Enterprise Resource Management Planning, sorry, is a business process management software that allows media entertainment companies to use integrated applications to manage the business of content anywhere from any time on any device. Clear's initial deployments and applications have primarily been focused on broadcast operations, but we've expanded it out to OTT platforms, distribution, and international servicing. Uh, DAX is a production workflow accelerator media asset management application designed to manage the content creation process. Focused on the distribution, review, and collaboration of production content, DAX is the inventor of digital dailies and won an Emmy in 2013 for transitioning the television industry from a file-based workflow to the cloud. We have several patents around the digital dailies process, and we pretty much work on about 85% of all scripted uh, television series, including everything produced by Fox, CBS, Warner Brothers, Lionsgate, AMC, and so forth. And on shows such as CSI, NCIS, Big Bang Theory, Mentalist, The Mentalist, uh, Mad Men, and many others. PFT merged, uh, P DAX was, um, sorry, PFT merged its post, uh, acquired DAX in 2014 and uh, it merged its post operations in New York and Burbank with DAX to create a full service technology, technology services, post and media services operation. DAX is currently migrating over to the Clear platform, which is going to happen, and we're uh, launching our first phase of this at NAB this year. So basically, what's a media ERP, and, uh, and what is our modules? Well, it's basically cloud media asset management, allowing different geographies, departments, and businesses to all collaborate on a single platform. We have operations and distribution cloud, which allow users to have scalable operations in, on the cloud, things like transcoding, auto QC, storage, package and delivery, and distribution. Um, as well as broadcast and production cloud are a combination of modules that we've prepackaged and built specifically for those industries. One of the most unique features of Clear is its hybrid cloud technology. The hybrid cloud allows us to have options that you can store content wherever you want. Um, you can basically store it in our cloud. You can store it on your local infrastructure and take advantage of what you've already got in place in, in your investments that you've made in storage and transcoding and QC applications and so forth. We also have the ability to store it at multiple locations. So you can store th certain things in the cloud if you need scalability, burstability, and so forth. But we also offer, offer real-time failover and DR uh, and redundancy for business continuity. Uh, in addition to that, we've also MPA audited, and we're a 2001 certified. So talking a little bit about it, just very high level over what we do within MAM. You mean, media asset management is, is, is obviously, is a lot of companies have already gone down this path, but our vision with MAM is that in, without workflow and operations and distribution associated with it, it's tough really to capitalize on the true value of having digital assets. So if we're looking at it is, is you need a secure environment to ingest, tag, and centrally manage and store all your media. The ability to search and clip content, do quick edits, create media strings or playlists with the ability to send it out to, straight, uh, to publish it to other stakeholders. Enable automated workflows for approvals and collaboration, the ability to add notes and comments associated to time code, SMPTE time code. Uh, it provides on-demand services like transcoding, watermarking, and DRM, as well as the ability to create asset essence. And uh, asset essence is basically an essence of the file to be able to do delivery and associate assets like closed captioning files, uh, dubbing files, metadata, and so forth. So you can actually create packages and send them on the fly in an automatic distribution right out of the system. We're currently integrated with approximately 500 different robots, that uh, digital robots that deliver content to outlets, OTT platforms, VOD channels, and the like. 
These are our customers, uh, pretty focused on the entertainment industry. And as I mentioned before, uh, our biggest customers in the United States is Warner Brothers, CBS, 20th Century Fox, Lionsgate, and A&E. All of those use us for all of their content management, uh, collaboration, and distribution through the production process. Outside of media asset management, we also offer a number of media services and post facility services, uh, anything of the like. A lot of our model is we do have a facility here in New York where we can do 4K finishing and full picture and audio services as well. We also have just recently acquired Lowry Digital out in Los Angeles, and, uh, and that allows us to do a lot of remastering, uh, SD to HD upresing, and 2K to 4K upresing as well. A lot of the work in our business model, though, is to work in a file-based workflow and be able to capitalize on the scalability that we have offshore to be able to do a lot of the processing like closed captioning and dubbing and the like and provide it more economically. Just to give you an idea of size and scale, um, 350,000 hours of content under management. Um, we were the first post-production facility here in New York where we did 4K finishing on a, a, a 60P show end-to-end -end, uh, for Discovery. Uh, we've also do, we just remastered and did all of The Simpsons in HD, Star Wars, Roseanne, Third Rock from the Sun. And, uh, and we're also doing deals with Warner Brothers and so forth where we're doing like 5,500 titles in closed captioning work. So what I'm going to do now instead of doing what I was supposed to do is I'm actually just going to walk you through a use case or sort of a case study of how uh, production companies are actually using the cloud media asset management and collaboration applications to manage production. This is pretty much how it's happening today. First and foremost is, you know, what were the primary catalysts that drove people to move towards cloud? And I can tell you one of the things, initially when I was actually the founder of DAX, and as we actually started the business, one of the biggest drivers was, and how we ended up going cloud and software as a service, was a lot of producers and post-production executives, they didn't want to deal with IT departments at, at the companies for security reasons, you know, getting caught up in logistics and politics and all this other stuff. So they ended up saying, hey, listen, can we actually use the systems and just actually pay you, and you can manage it on your own servers, and uh, we'll pay you on a show-by-show -show basis. It quickly evolved into enterprise deals and the like, but, and obviously IT got involved once we started scaling, but the real drivers behind this was initially to go to the cloud was that was our, that was our driver. What were the drivers to really see the explosion of business and where our business really grew? Um, we sort of struggled along for a number of years and then all of a sudden, boom, in about 2010, there was a number of catalysts within the marketplace that really drove our business to the next level. Those rack catalysts were really bandwidth and 4G, really being available everywhere and being able to stream much higher quality video instead of people being stuck with DSL or dial-ups at home. The other one is the iPad. And the iPad is really the perfect device for media production and media consumption. It's romantic, it's intimate, people can lie around and look at stuff when they want to. And it was really a huge driver of our business. Self-education. Through the proliferation of consumer-based technologies, which are really driving the way we're actually using technology today. I mean, we look at the leaders 10 years ago, and it was IBM, and it was so forth, the big companies. Now it's Apple. Now it's Facebook. Now it's, it's the consumer stuff that people want to see, and they want those same type of user, UI and UX experiences in the workplace. One of the things about it is, is more people are actually streaming content online than watching television, as we all know, and we all are well aware of Netflix's success. But self-education is a real driver. And then the last one is simplicity. We talk about one of the biggest catalysts. It's just you got to make it easy, right? You I mean you can't teach an old dog new tricks if it's dumbass simple. And that's what you got to do is you got to make it easy, press the big blue button, and make it Fisher Price. If you can get that done, you will be successful in technology. So beyond this is who uses us, right? So, sorry, what was the drivers of using us? So in the entertainment industry, the greatest impact on time to market is really time to decision. Time to decision is, is, is you know, you need a place to securely stage content, to be able to view stuff, collaborate on stuff, review it, approve it, send it to this guy, it's licensed for this particular territory. And really time decision within the entertainment industry is the biggest driver for time to market. And time to market is the biggest driver for time to consumption. So the faster that you can get it out, the faster people can buy it, and the faster the studios can make money. If you think about the difference with uh, day and date, which I'm sure a lot of people are aware of, a couple of years ago, n the international markets never touched American television because they always waited to see if it actually got canceled and made it through to a second season. Now you've got a 24-hour turnaround. Why? Because they can get it online. They can find it anywhere, YouTube, Netflix, whatever. 
the time to market is so fast these days that you got to be with it. So now I'm going to sort of walk you through a little bit of why they use us and so forth. So why is cloud and SaaS a perfect fit for this industry? Okay, so the industry is made up of studios, networks, entrepreneurs, banks, independent production companies, and a whole bunch of freelancers. Throw in a few global production partners, you throw in a Bix and boom, and a little few complicated, sorry, uh, you, you throw in a few global production partners into the mix, and then you have a really complicated distribution and collaboration logistics that go on throughout the course of production. Cloud's the perfect, perfect fit for this vertical because there are so many players involved in production and the delivery process. It allows you to turn off and on services when you need them in a central place to store, manage, and collaborate on ideas and truly have an around-the-clock environment to work. They also need a neutral ground to share assets. Um, I'll give you an example. So if you look at How I Met Your Mother, it's actually produced by Fox, but it airs on CBS. House is another great example. It was produced by NBC, but it aired on Fox. So you really need a central environment, a multi-tenant environment where people can all log into the same application and stream it from the same source. And all of this can get pretty complicated, never mind the politics that go along with it, if they had to lock in, uh, log into a dozen different systems to get their content. In addition to production workflow, there's also the management of finished content, international servicing, and digital distribution. The industry thrives on global accessibility of content to maximize our return. So when companies like Lionsgate or Miramax license a film or a TV series to an overseas partner, they can log in, distribute all their content deliverables that go along with the licensing deal, even down to the master of the content that needs to get transcoded and repurposed in different markets. So we can expand this diagram out to airlines and hotel chains and DVD replication facilities and the like. And you can see very quickly how this can be a pretty complicated workflow. So let me simplify this, take it down to a smaller subset. We have a couple of studios, broadcasters, production companies, production sets. Where is the use of cloud going in production and collaboration? Let's get down to the specifics and have a look. So producers and directors want to control the release of content like dailies to studios and broadcasters. A creative exec wants the ability to go in and string content together, collaborate, or send clips. Um, they want the ability to collaborate by adding notes and comments associated to time code, making comments public and private, and watermark some cuts for offline viewing or download, for, and making sure that people can only see it or access it for a limited time. Production and studio personnel expect these services today, and they need to be available on demand, and they need to be self-service. Instead of outsourcing them to big media service providers and sometimes having to wait days in order to get the work done. And, you know, this is just a couple years ago that we were in the mix on this. So these services, not just from DAX, are more accessible and, and attainable out through the internet. The market used to be served by big brick and mortar facilities, and they used to be the center of the ecosystem. But now it's more distributed. We're not just talking about cloud media services, but also post in general. So let me give you a couple more examples. We think about how much the dailies process has changed over the past few years, and we're only talking three, four years, right? We've gone from processing film in labs or, or sending masters to labs and stuff to onset solutions like MTI and Colorfront, where color, audio, video sync, editorial file creation and deliverables are all being done on the edge as opposed to being done in the brick and mortar. There's also no reason to believe these services that have gotten decentralized are going to become re-centralized once again. And the cloud will enable us to do this. So if you think about it, how long will it be until there's a 7G transmitter sitting on the top of a camera sending a signal right up into the cloud in real time? Think about it. Media capture, transmission, complete with metadata delivered in real time. It's going to happen. I keep thinking about this a little bit. If we, could, if we could transmit directly from the camera into the cloud, what about editorial? What about the, media, the metadata, the media, and the time code is all there and it's available. Why can't we edit in the cloud? Why do we need all the media in a local environment? Why do we need to pay for storage? Why do we need to pay for AVIDs? Why do we need to have all this infrastructure available to us? Why can't we access it from anywhere? Why can't we just pay for what we need? And why can't we scale on demand? Everybody's working with proxies anyways. And how much faster can marketing and publicity get uh, access to the assets to start creating their campaigns? They can provide instant secure access to creative agencies, trailer houses, who can even start cutting trailers, commercials, promos, and sizzle reels real time in the cloud without ever having complete access to the content in their local environments. This is just around the corner. Creatives want it. They're even demanding it. And they want unique or enhanced forms of programming and customer interaction as well. 
Eight years ago, there were many obstacles that faced going to the cloud. And today, the biggest problem is, is we can't develop this stuff fast enough. So a different topic, but similar and relevant, is you think about how fast the world changes. Um, with DAX, in particular, production workflow, we have a client services team in Los Angeles that uh, provides 24-7 around-the-clock service to all the productions to ensure they're getting what they need. We get calls from people now on airplanes complaining that they can't stream their content. I mean, this, 18 months ago, this didn't even exist. Now it's unacceptable if it doesn't work. So the market's changing very quickly. So looking beyond production, you know, just to sort of talk about big picture and where is the cloud going and what does it mean? And I'm sure some of my compatriots over here that we'll sit with will, will agree with me on this. Is it's cool, production workflow is cool, we're cloud enabled, we're producing content in the cloud. Amazing stuff, right? But it doesn't stop here. It's just a small subsection of the industry. So what about the whole ecosystem? So let's take a step back and look at this at an enterprise level. So you've got DAX, you've got iTunes, you've got your storage, you've got your distribution partners. You uh, might need a solution for archiving. You might need to get it over to a DVD replication facility. You might need to get something to Amazon or to Hulu or iTunes. You get it over to Deluxe to do some replication work. So pretty soon you have a combination of all these providers and you also have a pr all these users and all this complication, right? Pretty congested stuff. What do you got? Big bowl of spaghetti. So what are we gonna do to fix this? Well, in regards to cloud and what we need to do in order to fix the problem is, is, is we need to have the vision of an open cloud. We need to have a vision of, of APIs, uh, SOA architectures, integration points. The systems need to talk to each other. You need to, uh, studios, broadcasters and the like want to use the best of breed technologies that are available in the marketplace. And the way that they do that is to have open APIs and integration with people in the cloud and companies in the cloud. The alternative to this is a closed system, not connected to the internet and not connected to any of your partners. And really what this is doing is putting you on a island. So in a lot of ways, as we look forward, there has to be, we talk about hybrid cloud, we talk about full cloud, we talk about on-premise. It really needs to be a combination of all of the above. The cloud is an enable, enabler. So get your feet wet, don't get your head wet. Scale costs as you consume them. So last but not least, I will just sort of say is, I know that thinking about purchasing a MAM system is, you know, what are your key drivers? And a lot of people say, oh great, I have a media asset management system, I'm fully digital. Now what, right? What am I gonna do with this, right? And where do I go from here? So you really gotta ask yourself the questions for the key drivers for MAM. I mean, is it for uh, preservation? Is it for monetization? Is it for search and metadata? Is it for workflow? Asset transformation, packaging, and distribution. Security. Collaboration. Cloud versus on-premise. All the questions you need to ask yourself when you go through and make your MAM decision. Keep it simple, right? Make sure you get good requirements, get the right people looking at it, make, make the right people with the right intelligence that understand your business when you make a purchase decision about it. Last but not least, I will just say that Without all this integration, without sort of um, moving to the next level, you're really talking about MAM is really boring without workflow, processing, and distribution tools. There ain't a lot to it. Dashboards are the key to the future. You need to have visibility, communication, and knowledge of what's going on in your systems, in your workplace, and with your assets. The studios and networks, they need to build these dashboards instead of building systems. They need to build interface in order to connect to many systems out in the marketplace. And the cloud vendors, stick to your core competency and do it well. Integration, open APIs, and interoperability. Thank you. If anybody's going to NAB, let me know. Vizrt is the next speaker, Aram Krishane. No, no. See if we can get it right. Krishane Sami. I can't read my own writing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Internal versus outside access. Designing MAM. Um, hi, my name is uh, Arun Krishnaswamy. 
Um, I am, let me get this up first and then I'll start talking. Um, I'm the director of technology for the Viz1 platform, which is Vizarty's media asset management system. Um, that's a slightly unwieldy title, but there's a history to it. Um, and this talk, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use you know, a slightly compressed uh, way of referring to the topic going forward. We're not going to be seeing that on every slide. <coughs> As I said, um, director of technology, part of the professional services group uh, in Vizarty, New York. I was previously. I was previously a solution architect with the same product uh, in the same group. And um, really what this talk is, is um, something for distillation of some of the things I've learned uh, and observed from building you know, medium to large sized MAM systems over the past few years. So this is not really going to talk, this is more or less the only slide on which we're going to talk about VizRT and Viz1 and so on. This is really more of a system stock, how you design the system, the kinds of things you want to see, the kinds of things you don't want to see, and um, in, in conjunction with some of the things that were said earlier today on this podium, uh, how you actually go about acquiring such a system and uh, you know, what you want to pay attention to when you're doing something like that. So uh, let's see here. Right, so distributed access to MAM systems. This is not quite the same thing as distributed MAM systems, but there is significant overlap in the topics, obviously. Um, my first time at SMT, and thank you for inviting me here uh, to talk, so I wasn't really sure at what, you know, at what level to pitch this conversation. Um, if it's too high or too low, you know, we can always uh, go to the Q&A and you know, go either way. Uh, so really what I'm going to do here is talk to you about the use cases, which has already been covered to some extent. Why would you want to enable distributed access to a media asset management system? Um, the term itself, media asset management or a MAM system, is a bit, um, it's, it's vague. You don't really get a sense of what you're talking about when you just say MAM system, because it can be anything from that to your box in the last track of your data center that services four API calls from all the applications within the organization to something that spans eight racks and several libraries, potentially half your data center. So somewhere between those two extremes, along that continuum, most MAM systems reside. When you open up a MAM system, uh, when you use the kinds of architectures that we've talked about today, uh, there are trade-offs, obviously. The, building a MAM system is a giant trade-off, and within it are hidden many, many other trade-offs. We're going to talk about some of those things. And uh, of course, when there's a trade-off, you pay something and you get something back, and we're going to look at both sides of that equation as well. So. Um, MAM systems are somewhat insidious in the sense that when you have a successful deployment to such a system, it is sticky. It tends to put down roots within an organization. And um, not the keyword, successful MAM system deployment, by the way. Um, and there are several reasons for this. One is that it, it, it sort of it becomes, and again, you know, this, is, this is not true for all MAM systems. This is true for many MAM systems, depending on the scope of the deployment. They have integrations with a lot of critical in-house and external systems. Many examples have been provided today. In many, many ways, the MAM system is sort of the first single pane interface to your entire organization that provides insight into your workflows, media workflows and other workflows. It, in many cases, is the first time that people within the organization have the ability to search across entire content libraries within a single interface. It is a transformative deployment in, some, in many, many ways. Of course, we are now in a, in a phase where people, many people have already built first generation MAM systems, maybe even second or third generation, they're moving to the third or fourth generation MAM systems. It's still the case, though, that we are not yet at the point where all of these work as well as they should. Um, but it's true that even a partway successful MAM is susceptible to organic growth within the organization. And by that I mean when it, there's existence proof that this works. You have a group that's using a MAM system and a group that's not. Uh, they see firsthand what it enables and they want in typically. So it's rare, of course there are cases where you deploy very purpose specific 
uh, MAM systems that are confined to a group or set of users, and there's only one thing or two things that the MAM system does, and that's the end of it. But most of the time, that's not the case. Typically, MAM systems can do a lot of things, and most people want to explore the capabilities of MAM system, and it grows within the organization. Therefore, it's even more important that you do um, your due diligence, you do the workflow design analysis up front, and you leave room for expansion. Uh, a MAM system at the end of the day is a toolkit. You mold it to your requirements. Um, and therefore, as part of all this, distributed access is really a when, not an if question. Um, this is um, a real world system context diagram, as we call it, for one of our deployments in the southern hemisphere. By no means the most complex or the largest, but I just wanted to put this up to show you an example of what a non-trivial MAM system deployment looks like. There can be tens, sometimes, I don't want to say hundreds, but you know, a hundred integration points is not uncommon. Uh, you will tie together legacy systems, internal and external. Uh, you will be talking to potentially, you know, tens of different software platforms. Um, this takes time to get right, and you, you know, it's an iterative process. It's rare that somebody goes in and builds a system like this and gets it right out of the box. So, again, design workflow analysis and design is critical. Um, even more so when you know your the scope of your deployment is not just within your organization. Potentially, you're inviting in your customers or partners to share the MAM system with you. Um, so what are some of these use cases? And again, there have been people with beautiful slides up here that you know, did, this much, did a much better job of enumerating this. But this is the, um, you know, the core of it, really. Um, again, I'm, I'm talking strictly about when you have a MAM system in-house and you're inviting in other people, people not within the same building, potentially not in the same organization. Many, many non-trivial use cases. Syndication, distribution by rights owners of content. Um, you have a remote workforce, or you have multiple sites within the organization, and you don't want to deploy disparate MAM systems or two instances of the MAM system. You want one logical instance, and therefore now you need to enable people working you know, in different countries, different states, into the same system. You need to manage access. You need to control what they see. You need to enable them to do what they need to do within the confines of that one logical system. Potentially, you're crowdsourcing some of your workflows or employing um, ag external agencies across the country, across the world, wherever. They need to see what they need to see in your content library and no more. Um, again, a case for distributed access. Mobile users. I'm sitting in the data center with my mobile device. Is it likely that uh, I'm using the Wi-Fi network to access a MAM system? Maybe. Maybe not. I'm a visitor, and I'm going out through my GSM or LT provider, and then I'm coming back into your data center, even though the server is sitting in front of me. Another case for remote access. Um, remote deep archiving. This is um, you know, a topic that is increasingly on a lot of people's radar. Storage is cheap. Cloud storage is, seems very cheap, and therefore a lot of people are interested in figuring out how to leverage those costs. And of course, there are always one-off events. Um, you, you have an in-house MAM system, and you, know, you have a unit doing things at the Olympics or the World Cup or whatever, and they need access to your MAM system. They are con there's content they're producing there that they need to get back in. They need to put together shows. So plenty of reasons why this is an important topic. Now, it is hard to tack on capabilities um, on top of a system that's not designed to handle many of these use cases from the ground up. And frankly, it's rare for any system to get this right the first time. Hopefully, the system you're looking at or working with has gone through several iterations where people have learned the lessons of what's needed to enable and control this kind of a workflow, these workflows. Um, and really, I've outlined some of the basic things you expect to see in a MAM system that is capable of handling uh, these workflows. So of course, you know, standards compliant, browser and mobile interfaces. This is sort of a given these days. It's definitely the first, to an extent the second to today. Web browsers are marvels of technology. There are thousands and thousands of expert manuals that have gone into optimizing these interfaces and the platform. Probably the most efficient application delivery architecture we have available to us today. Therefore, it makes sense for us to use it. Increasingly in the context of, you know, enterprise broadcast workflows, they have specific multimedia features built in that are tailor-made for MAM systems. I'm think, talking of things like synced audio playback, timecode support, um, 
support for formats that you know most common proxies are uh, using these days. Fine-grained access control. I mean, this is a no-brainer, really. You want to be able to control exactly what anyone sees at any point, uh, media and metadata. You want to be able to audit uh, who did what within the MAMP system when. Um, you want to be able to monitor the system. Maybe you have a, a MAMP system that comprises 200 servers distributed all over the country, and uh, there needs to be a single interface so that you can actually, your operations group can actually keep track of everything that's going on with these systems. Uh, it's a capability that the MAMP system should enable, if not provide directly, at least. And of course, things that people consider should be part of a MAMP system anyway, and they should be. Intelligent file management, delivery, and distribution capabilities. This is another reason why you brought the MAMP system in-house in the first place. And as somebody else mentioned, um, extensibility via APIs. Uh, the reality is the only way you'll build a successful system is if you have the many pieces loosely coupled approach today, which is you know sometimes called SOA. The broad principle really stems from the Unix architecture from 50, 60 years ago. Um, and of course, the elephant in the room, cloud infrastructure integration. Much has been said about it. And um, I think it's worth repeating that it's a fantastic enabler, but it's complicated uh, in terms of pricing and whether it, you, you, really you have to spend a lot of time figuring out the combination of on-premises and cloud infrastructure that works best for you. There is no one size fits all in this space. Um, these are specific attributes for MAM systems, but I find it easier or better to think in terms of two broad classes of attributes that MAM systems have when you're looking at them from, say, the 30,000 foot view. There are the mechanisms. There are the things that the MAM system does, the features, so to speak. Ingest, transfer, con you know, conforms, transcodes, exports, and so on and so forth. And then there are the policies, you know, the security that's associated with each workflow. How do you actually prioritize one thing over the other? Auditing, monitoring, and so on and so forth. It helps to think of this as a two-dimensional matrix. And really, you know, each of the mechanisms should be capable of being controlled along each of these policy um, columns or axes, if you will. Um, and a good MAM system should, you know, it shouldn't be a sparse matrix. It should, should tick most of those boxes, really. Of course, you know, when you are deploying such a system, there is a trade-off. And this is the flip side of the trade-off, complexity. Um, Obviously, you need to spend a fair amount of time in design analysis. What are you going to do with this MAM system, really, when it comes in-house first? Um, and again, I can only stress the value of the iterative process here. Please don't go in expecting to deploy 50 workflows within four months you know, of the MAM system coming in. That's not how it works. Start small. Start with a basic install. Get users, the people who actually use this in the field and in the offices. Let them play with it. Let them have a say in the design process. Our most successful deployments have been systems where uh, the workflows grew, you know, where they were tacked on you know, after we proved out that the base system worked, and then you know, some iteration uh, about that worked, and then so on and so forth. You really don't want to go in and build a monolithic system for six months and then plop it in front of your users and expect them to like it. They may, but the probability is somewhat low. <laughs> um, Judicious selection of hardware infrastructure, accuracy, and sizing. This really, again, goes back to the cloud question in some ways. Um, it's important for on-premises infrastructure, but it's even more important for cloud infrastructure. You talk to any cloud vendor, uh, whether it be Amazon or SoftLayer or you know, really anyone in their business, um, who will be around in 20 years' time, by the way. And they will tell you that TCO calculations are really, really difficult. It's in their interest to help you to make these TCO calculations, but you should also do your own you know, calculations. because. You, the, along the continuum of completely on-premises, completely on-cloud, somewhere is a sweet spot for you. And it's probably not the sweet spot for anyone else. Uh, it pays it pays in spades to really spend some time thinking about this. Um, and of course, education. Uh, when you have a system that's two U, two, two, two U boxes in the data center, there's maybe five users or 20 users, and education isn't such a big deal. Hundreds of users, or thousands of users, hundreds of servers, lots of complex workflows. There's an investment that has to be made in the user and administrative education. This is, again, something that we've seen really pays for itself many times over, over the course of you know, MAM system's life, which you know, is five to 10 years, I would say, today. Um, and of course, the big one, the security trade-off, which merits its own slide, really. Um, I said there's a history to the title, and um, this topic was um, 
discussed at an SVG media asset management panel back in December. And we spent a lot of time talking about security then because the Sony breach was in the news at that point. And this dominated the discussion. Um, unfortunately, security is the kind of topic that everybody wants to talk about, uh, everybody has an opinion on, but really very, very few people are qualified to give you advice you can take to the bank. <laughs> so I'm not th that person, I'll tell you up front, but I'll tell you what are the things you need to watch out for. Perhaps the most prevalent approach is what is called the M&M security model, the hard shell soft kernel approach to security, or perimeter security as it's called. Unfortunately, even though it's widely prevalent, probably the most common approach, it's dangerously outlated as we've learned in the last two, three, five years. Um, there is another culinary model, a, culinary, a model with a culinary context, uh, the Swiss cheese model, which is much better uh, for security. It's not the only one, but you, know, you should look it up. Uh, but from the context of building a MAM system, a distributed MAM system, or a MAM system that allows access for a lot of different people, intra and you know, intra-organization, um, what you really need is to quantify what it is you're doing with the MAM system. And this means building a threat model in the context of security, or multiple threat models. What are you protecting from whom, and how much are you willing to pay to protect it? What is the value of the content? How much are you willing to pay to protect it? When you have a clear idea of that, you have a budget for how much time and money you can spend on building security features. Certifications and so on and so forth are definitely important, and they're sort of, a, you know, it's sort of, those are table stakes, so to speak. But at the end of the day, you know your content best, you know the value of your content best, and you are responsible for deploying whatever security is needed to protect it. Therefore, prepare for a potential breach. What what is the impact going to be? When you find out you're breached, that's not the time to go around trying to figure out what to do. You need to rehearse for a potential breach. And that means having protocols, people, training, and documentation in place to deal with such an eventuality. I don't want to say that it's a when, not an if for this. But unfortunately, that is the case for many, many people and organizations. Uh, the internet is a pretty hostile place, I'm afraid, <laughs> if that wasn't already obvious. and. Uh, very important follow on here. MAM vendors, by and large, are not security professionals, but they should be clued in. We should be clued in. And by clued in, I mean we should be aware of best practices. When your security consultant comes in and asks us about protocols, how we secure content at rest, at motion, whatever, we should be able to give you answers that satisfy the security consultant. Avoid backbox security. Avoid security that relies on proprietary protocols. The best security protocols in the world are only available either to those with compartmentalized uh, security clearances or available for free download on the internet in the form of open source and free software. There is not much in between, really. If you have people trying to sell you proprietary security protocols, be wary. <laughs> you may want to do professional commission professional security audits based on your assessment of the value of the content you protecting. And really, it, those things have significant, they provide significant value, but again, you know, just because somebody couldn't break into your system doesn't mean someone else won't be able to break in. And this again goes back to the prepare for a breach uh, data point. It's a hard trade-off, because at the end of the day, the more secure you make a system, almost always, the less usable you make the system. So somewhere along that continuum, another continuum, you have to find your sweet spot. The reason I spend talking, so much time talking about security is that this is not something that most people have in mind when they go into provision a MAM system or procure a MAM system. It tends to be not an afterthought, but it tends to be one of the many data points to look at during the course of the acquisition. But if at all your system is going to expose its, uh, you know, some interface to the open internet, this should really be one of the more important things you look at. Um, Leslie Lamport said something rather nice uh, about 30 years ago. He is one of the pioneers in distributed computing systems, and he basically provided one of the most pithy definitions of what a distributed system is. A distributed system is one in which the failure of a computer you don't even know existed can render your own computer unusable. And that's even 35 years later, that's perhaps the best definition you can get in one sentence. It's sobering, but it's the truth. Um, so after all those caveats and talks of trade-offs, what do you actually get in return for building a system like this? Um, well, the promise of a MAM system is that it allows you to mold your workflows free from arbitrary constraints. Um, you don't want users or creative people thinking in terms of, how do I get this file from LA to New York? You really want to design your workflows 
uh, in a manner that makes the most sense from an organizational and you know, creative perspective. And MAM systems should enable that. One important caveat, the laws of physics still apply. So don't design workflows that depend on you breaking the speed of light or the available network bandwidth. Um, and as I said earlier, really the benefits have been talked about you know, pretty comprehensively at this point. But the ability to go to one single pane of glass, uh, one interface, uniform, that is able to provide a view into all your workflows, all your content, uh, the ability to drive everything from one interface, one through one system. It's you know it's sort of utopian, but a well uh, architected MAM system will get you pretty far along, you know, to realizing that goal. It's not going to get you all the way. There are always going to be hurdles and workarounds and constraints. Sometimes MAM vendors like us impose constraints not arbitrarily, but because we are somewhat opinionated in how things should work. And if that's the case, you should find out. If something doesn't work the way you expect it to, you should expect an answer, a clear answer as to why it doesn't work that way. And you know, the MAM vendor should be able to provide one to you. Um, the ability to unify you know, content management and distribution workflows. Really, the, you don't want two systems that will want to manage your content, another distribute your content, as uh, the, you know, the gentleman from um, Prime Focus said. You want this to be one unified system where the content flows through in a logical fashion. And you know something we haven't talked about much, disaster recovery capabilities. When you build a distributed system or a system that is supposed to cater to users from many different places, by necessity, you know, the architecture is going to be distributed. Therefore, you have geo-redundant distribution of your content and metadata, and it's easier to build a system that's more resilient to all kinds of breakdowns and catastrophes. Not everything, but you know, you're further along than most people when you build a system in this fashion rather than in a silo. And you know, bootstrap workflows and so on and so forth at remote locations. Um, one last quote, and then I'm done. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is known as Conway's law in the software engineering community. Um, organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of those organizations. It's a somewhat unwieldy sentence, but it's a fairly profound observation. This was made in 1968, but it's been rigorously validated by many, many organizations like Microsoft, Google, and so on over the years. If you look at a MAM system deployment you know, in, in, from a certain perspective, your workflows within the, media, uh, within the media asset management system are really your communication structures within the organization. So deploying a MAM system is one of those rare opportunities to you know, shape the communication structures of your organization. And therefore, you know, take the, make the best use of it. And um, you know, I hope you, whoever is looking at MAM systems, procuring them, and so on and so forth, I wish you every success. Thank you. If all the speakers would come up, we'd like to have a Q and A now. And for those that have not met her yet, I'd like to introduce Sarah, who is the co-chair on this meeting. And I'd also like to take this time to thank the gentleman in the back of the room. Tim Dwight, who did all the work behind the season, seeing, getting this together. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. Um, questions and answers now. Feel free to fire away at these guys. They are experts up here. So, any questions out in the audience? Okay, you guys are gonna make me go first. You got a question? Go ahead, Sean. They're not allowed anywhere. Different approaches? Um, how are you different from each other, or how do you perceive yourself to be different? Well, um, I suppose I, I, I can start. I said, uh, I always hate it when somebody says, Is this thing on? Um, is this thing on? 
Uh, oh, thank you. Um, is, yes, it's on. That's why I hate it. Okay. Um, I think one difference that comes out immediately um, is that I, I believe all the um, other panelists are involved in sort of asset management as a discipline of itself. Um, and whereas we, we do not position Stratus as an asset management system. That's one of the reasons we wrote the RESTful API for it, is, is so that it could be easily integrated into um, uh, an enterprise or other asset management system. And I think, um, excuse me, just one of the other, I, th I think one of the other speakers mentioned that, um, I don't, I, I don't want to, he said boring, uh, but asset management by itself, you know, sort of tells you where all the bits are, but several of the presenters mentioned that the, the important part is to make, do something to make the bits worth more. And uh, we, we put what we do in that role, which I think is quite different from everyone else here who really uh, do seem to me, from what I heard, to be very much involved in the classical de definition of asset management. Um, I think we're gonna we're gonna go down the line. So um, yeah, a bunch of different uh, thoughts, and we can do bullet points of what's good about a system, everything else. But we we've been in industry a very long time, and and if you step back and what's the good and the bad and everything else, it's it's about service and doing right by the customer, com doing a complete integrated uh, workflow and design and everything else. And as a long term partner and working with with that customer. No system ever existed is going to be 100% of the box. So whether the number is 60 or 80 or 85% of what you need, the question is how much you're going to rely on them to finish the rest of that piece and do right by you. I guess for us, I'd probably say one of the differentiators is just services itself. I don't think any of my people sitting at the panel actually do post services and media services and so forth. Uh, our company is pretty much 50-50 on technology-related services, as, and 50% of it is, is revenue is derived from media services and post-production. So we try to integrate the two of them together. Um, we don't necessarily have to do one without the other. Uh, we have clients that only buy our application services. We have clients that only buy our media services. So it might be a differentiator. Yeah, yeah I think on, on our part, we're, we're we're kind of a hybrid of both uh, a media asset management with a production component integrated into the platform. And really our differentiator and our approach uh, to projects and, and, and to uh, uh, putting forth a, a media asset management at our customers is the whole aspect of uh, change management. It's a workflow exercise. It's, it's a re-engineering of how you used to work to how you're gonna be able to work by putting forth these, these technologies. And it, it, it can be disruptive or it can enhance the, the production depending on what the, what the value the organization puts the emphasis on. But it's, it's, it's a very different approach than saying our product does X, Y, and Z if you want more, it's not there. It'll look at the back of the box, it's got six BNCs, you want seven, buy two boxes. Our platform is a workflow engine, so what do you want it to do? It's shaped towards that goal, and being very flexible and agile in adapting the workflow to the customer specificity. And that's why we're in different verticals with the same platform. Uh, most of you probably know Wizard T is a graphics company. Um, it just still, I think the split between graphics, and broadcast graphics, and MAM for us is about 70-30. The Wiz One platform, the ma media asset management platform, um, is a fifth generation platform, previously known as uh, Wiz Media Engine, and even earlier as Ordom, which is from a company called Ordendo that was acquired by Wizard T. Um, so really, the product has had a lot of time to mature, and with the acquisition and the integration and so on and so forth, there's two aspects to the system that are sort of critical. Because we have so many uh, in-house systems that are distinct from the MAM, um, which we, one of the key drivers has been, over the past few years has been integrating these components, you know, the broadcast graphics chain with the media asset management chain. Of course, in and of itself, that provides a lot of value, and it's a differentiator, but beyond that, um, what it has done is uh, it has forced us, or I should say driven us, to make the MAM system per se modular. And this is the whole you know, many pieces loosely coupled approach. Um, 
Ordome um, runs very, very large systems. There are very large media management system deployments with Ordome. Um, one of the things that the current generation platform enables, because it's modular, because API is a first class, and what that essentially means is it's like turtles all the way down. There is a, an API for everything in the system, and we expose a subset to partners and customers. It has forced us to build this toolkit, really, um, which is available to you know customers, which is available to partners and integrators and so on. So we are happy to, we are able and happy to provide the end-to-end -end workflow, but we recognize that that's not always the case, or it's rarely the case. Therefore, we are open to integrating and talking to pretty much anything else that you have available within your plant through the API. OK, thank you. Another question? Oh, good. Oh, OK. Hi, I'm Larry Taylor. Uh, so my question for, for you guys is, each one of you, in your own way, uh, had uh, ex exposed some issues about cloud storage, uh, either security or cost or transcoding power or whatever. Um, I'd like you to address where you think that's going in terms of the future is it coming? Are those problems coming down at the rate of Moore's law, half every two years, or is it actually coming down more quickly or more slowly than that? Thanks. Well, uh, certainly in, in in our context, we're we're an umbrella on top of these various tier technologies, you know, spinning this, LTO, cloud, et cetera, et cetera. So we're we're. In, in our view, it's it's really what the mandate the customer chooses. You're right in in, in terms of the curve and, and, and the cost per terabyte. Uh, on, on our side, it's it's. You know, I I sell a man whatever you shove under it, I'll manage, and it's it's what your driving metric is as an organization that's going to dictate the technology that you want to use. And, and all the while making it seamless at the user experience. They have no clue whether it's on you know, one tier or another. You don't want to affect the user interaction because of the technology that you choose uh, under the hood. I'd probably say on uh, cloud technology right now is it's good for bursting. It's, it, there are certain attributes. I haven't looked at it for a little while, and, but somewhere like Amazon, I think it was to, to take a full res resolution, sorry, movie um, and store there for a year was like 17,000 bucks. So it, the co it isn't cost effective right now to be distributing masters and mezzanine files and so forth. It's, it's cost effective to move them, but it isn't cost effective to leave them there. Um, so in a lot of cases, depending on who the customer is, depending on what their requirements are, uh, I think a lot of it is fear of the unknown is in regards to security. Um, some people want their assets partitioned off and separated from other assets. Some of them don't care. Um, so it really just depends on the flavor, and it, it actually changes on, uh, from a studio basis, it changes from studio to studio. From a security standpoint, I think there's still a little bit of unknown out there. Uh, I'm not sure what sort of validation has been done with Amazon and others like that. I know that they're in the process of going through some sort of validations, but um, again, it, it, a lot of this stuff is um, the eye of the beholder today, and I think it's going to change. I think costs will go down. Yeah, there's more players. I know that with Microsoft coming into the marketplace, Google is launching their uh, their big um, cloud play. I mean, the more players that get into the marketplace, the more the price will go down. We all understand that. And, um, and I think that's what, where the market will go. Well, as the price goes down, the other thing that keeps going up is resolutions as you go from, from SD to HD to 4K to 8K. So by the time it's, it's dirt cheap, the uh, Probably the Japanese will be talking 16K, whatever the heck that means. I don't care to think about it. Um, and then it's not its not a linear thing because it's one component is what is the cost per terabyte, but then there's so many other factors of security and, and um, everything else involved. So really, it's kind of, it's never going to be a linear fashion. I completely agree with something that Aaron said about um, there is no one sweet spot uh, that's going to be very idiosyncratic. Uh, we are involved in something right now, and as I mentioned about um, the days of, you know, where everything goes directly from the camera to storage somewhere. Those days are now. Uh, such systems are being conceptualized and out for bid right now. And in the, the decision as to whether where that video and audio goes from the camcorder, whether it be to some dedicated, high-performance, traditional, quote, broadcast storage, 
or some data center somewhere or the real cloud is entirely an economic decision being made by that customer. It, it simply, um, the, the notion is also mentioned, the notion of the proxy, the ubiquity of proxy workflows, where the, the television production has sort of recapitulated cinema now where you make a high, high uh, resolution camera master and you put it in the vault and everything you do after then is struck off a work copy until it's time to render and then you go back to the vault. Um, so those type of things, well, you don't have to, you, you're just paying that price of getting it up and down once and everything else is going on at a very portable and disposable resolution. Make it much easier for, for companies to find that sweet spot for themselves and, and increasingly that is involved in someone other than themselves owning the disks that their content is stored on. Um, good points all. Uh, specifically addressing the uh, cost vis-a-vis -vis Moore's law, you know, transistor density and so on and so forth. I think it's uh, worth keeping in mind that when Amazon sells you an instance, whatever it is, M3 X large for 27 cents an hour or whatever, you're not just paying for the CPU and the disk and whatever, you're also paying for the data center rental, the uh, security, the power and so on and so forth. And you can be sure they've priced it into that model. Um, this is an opinion, um, and you know it, 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 it should be validated. The, I, I believe the sweet spot today for cloud workflows is still where you are either turning things around rapidly, transient workflows, or deep archive workflows. Um, the whole OPEX, CAPEX argument certainly has some merits to it, but in all the calculations and numbers I've seen, and I think David put this up on one of his slides, uh, if you know you're going to be running a system for three years and you spec out the systems uh, on premises and on the cloud and you're running the exact same workflows in both places, you're going to come out way ahead doing this on premises because you have predictable workflows, predictable traffic. You're simply going to be paying three to five to ten times more if you put this all on Amazon or Google or Azure infrastructure. Really, what the cloud is useful for today in, in our context is quick experiments, proof of concepts, development systems, test systems, um, one-off events, um, and potentially deep archiving. Again, that's constrained by just bandwidth, you know, the availability of bandwidth everywhere. Distribution, syndication, those sorts of things. But simply transitioning your existing on-premises workflow onto cloud servers and storage is going to be very, very expensive. So the curve is complicated, and again, it's a, it, it really is up to each operation to figure this out. Okay. We had one more. There's a lot, of uh, a lot of talk about, it's Gary Olson, and there's a lot of talk about interfacing with APIs and SOA, SOAP, RESTful, and all of the integrations there, but you didn't talk about integration of metadata, which is usually the orphan child, and standards or schemas that would be common across multiple platforms that would help the end user as they build their asset management system. Yeah, well, uh, schemas are great, but they, uh, they basically put you in a corner the moment uh, your business reality or your deliverables change and you need to adapt that schema. So it's the same component. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't, I couldn't see. It's, it's the same problematic adopting a standard that is, uh, that is uh, stringent and then something change and you're stuck with that, that scope. Our approach is more on a, uh, a fluid uh, methodology for de defining the schemas and having the ability to quickly transform it to anything else that's gonna evolve down the line. So not being locked into a PB Core or, or Dublin, et cetera, et cetera, but having the framework to emulate it and having the, 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 uh, the infrastructure to easily adapt, evolve, and change it on the fly as you have new requirements in your metadata model, because you will. Uh, so, so adhering to a standard is, is certainly you know, uh, valid, but ensuring that the solution can be nimble enough to evolve from that standard uh, over time is, uh, to us, a, a big emphasis for, for our customers. 
Yeah, I would just I would echo Luke's sentiments there. I mean, it's a, if you get too rigid with your uh, metadata models and templates and so forth, is you're not going to be able to optimize the inputs that you're actually putting into the system. And the system's got to be in every single, you know, not every single one, but uh, you know, it, there's so many, there's hundreds and hundreds of VOD and online distribution channels and OTT platforms and so forth. And there is no standard set across. It's sort of like media. I mean, we have no standards. We have certain standards out there, but there's so many different formats and resolutions and frame rates and, and bit rates and everything else that goes with it that there, you know, we wish that it would get standardized, but it would make everybody's life a hell of a lot easier. But it, I don't think it'll ever happen. Yeah, there's certainly a, a, a real value to planning of a system before it's implemented and everything else. But then at the end of the, end of the day, flexibility is, is is such a key thing and what's required and what's optional. Uh, Whatever is the ideal thing will not be the ideal thing on the road. So the reality. Yeah, um, wrestling with this for about 15 years now. Um, the the issue with metadata, particularly descriptive metadata, is not a lack of standards. It's probably that there's too many. Um, there seems to be you know uh, the, the difficulty of, of uh, deriving a schema and a, even a dictionary that everyone's going to agree on winds up with with um, this really kind of. A hall of mirrors situation you wind up in. What do you do at the organization that's always referred to the person who carries a camera on his shoulder and takes capture sound and image of uh, news stories? I've always called that person a photographer. Oh, do you stop calling him a photographer? Call him a videographer because you have some that simply won't that won't work in the context of the. Somebody mentioned the comm channels that already exist in an organization. Uh, it simply won't work. What, what the approach we've taken instead is the same one everyone else has mentioned, is you know, we don't, uh, a Stratus system ships with no pre-configured descriptive metadata fields in it. The only pre-configured fields in it are uh, technical and structural metadata fields that we consume ourselves. However, the entirety of the database can be, um, on any record, can be um, exported through a built-in XSLT processor. And we can, so we can map out to anything, and we can also map in from anything. And we don't, there's no special, you know, we use COTS uh, tools like Altova or things like that. We don't care what tool you use uh, to create that map. You give us an XSLT, you, f you throw it in a certain folder, and it shows up as a new import or export op uh, option within a couple of minutes. And I think that, that's that flexibility that Luke was talking about long term. Um, yeah, I agree with everything said here. I should also add, though, that one of the reasons we probably didn't talk about this as much uh, was that most MAM systems have fairly sophisticated metadata handling frameworks in place these days. After all, we are in the third or fourth generation of digital MAM systems. Um, and as I said, transformation between schema or you know between serialization formats is, I don't want to say it's trivial, but it's possible. Before you, oh, that's loud now. Just before you leave, make sure all the brownies are eaten from the back of the room. And we'll see you in uh, a month.